Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Continuing Clinical Research Innovations After COVID-19. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speaker. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now this chat box is located in the control panel and that's found on the right hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Elego Health Research, who developed the content for this presentation. Elego Health Research, a healthcare enabling research organization, uses electronic health records and the trusted patient and physician relationship to ensure all patients have access to clinical research as a care option. Powered by their GOES Direct approach and novel Intelligo Research Stack clinical technology, their team provides access to the best healthcare experts experts, patients, and research technologies. They engage physicians and patients who otherwise would not participate in clinical research and accelerate the development of new pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and medical device and diagnostic products. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce your speaker for today's event, and that's Eli Alford, Chief Operating Officer at Elego Health Research. Eli brings nearly 40 years of leadership experience to Elego, along with a strong track record of increasing productivity and improving organizational and individual effectiveness. Prior to Alego, Eli was COO of Shawman IRB for six years, leading one of the largest independent commercial institutional review boards in North America. There he worked with more than 600 study sponsors, including most of the top 50 global biopharm companies and thousands of principal investigators. During Eli's tenure, Shalman navigated through private equity ownership changes and a successful merger to create Advara. Eli earned a BA from the Virginia Military Institute and MS from the University of Southern California and was a National Security Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. And now I will pass over the controls to our speaker, Eli. Eli, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time today. This will take an hour. We'll get it done. And I'm, I'm going to save about 15 minutes uh, at the end to, to entertain questions if you have them. Uh, let me pull up the presentation here to make sure I'm showing you the right one. And there it is. So uh, thanks very much for joining. Uh, when, when I was first asked to do this was about a little over a month ago. And at the time, uh, we were in the United States, in, in the, really in the middle of trying to figure out what kind of pandemic we were in uh, with COVID. And we were starting to, to have ma major changes in the studies that we're doing at Elego uh, and across the industry. And um, so we thought it would be a good idea to talk about decentralized trials, which is one of the, our functions uh, and one of our specialties. And, and so as I started researching it, my thesis was that if, uh, if a pandemic could could be a catalyst for change in an industry, um, as it appears to be right now with many changes we see around us. Did it happen before? And so I look back at the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic, uh, and I ran across this lady, Anna Williams. Um, and as I think about Anna Williams, I, I think about being a, a, a female researcher uh, in 1920s, 1910s, and 1920s. Uh, the challenges she might have faced. I think about what she's thinking about as I look into her eyes and, um, you know, and, and what her experience was. And what I'm thinking she's thinking is, I wish this photographer would take the picture so I can get back to my work. She's got her Petri dishes there, or Petri dishes, if you prefer that pronunciation, and her microscope. And she was one of the researchers who was trying to identify the pathogen that caused the influenza pandemic. And actually, they never found it, not until the pandemic was done. They found it, they identified it uh, a few years later. 
but what I expected to find was some surge of research uh, interest and, and, and change in how we did research at that time. And frankly, my thesis proved false. I did, I did not find that. Um, I, that doesn't mean uh, that didn't happen. I just didn't find the evidence for it. But it, but it did get me to thinking about the changes in research and, and what, uh, you know, what we have, have done over the last years, hundreds of years, thousands of years in advancing medicine and how that fits with uh, advances in other sciences. And, and so one of, the, uh, one of my colleagues um, shared this article with me from uh, bbc.com uh, uh, about the process of changing industries based on new technologies. And the question is, is why did, didn't electricity Im immediately change manufacturing? Uh, steam power came into being in the in early, kind of early 1800s. Uh, and they built factories around steam power. So you'd have on the on the uh, left-hand side, you have this factory that has one steam engine on the outside of the building that is pushing all these axles and pulleys and belts, and uh, and and they they built this factory around that technology. Now you can imagine when electricity came along, 1880-ish, when, uh, when when the first light bulb came into being. Uh, they they started using electricity in factories too. They they took that steam power away and they plugged in an electric motor, and that electric motor powered the same gears and pulleys and axles uh, as as you see here. Uh, and so why didn't they change it? Why didn't they change the factory? Well, when you invest in a factory, you build all this equipment. You build that factory. Uh, the, the way it is. And if, if you want to change the factory, you've got to tear the whole thing down and rebuild it in a new way. And why would anybody do that? If the factory is working, why, why would you change it? Well, they eventually did change it. So let's say 40 years later, 40 years after electricity came into to being in use, uh, they did start building factories and eventually did tear down these old factories with steam engine. So I got to thinking, what does it change to change uh, take to change the clinical research factory that we all work in. Um, you know, the, the technology was the threat to this old way of, of, of this cotton mill on the left, but eventually it became an opportunity for the new ways of the doing things on the right from the 1920s with a, a jewelry maker. So what does it take to change our, our factory? So let me, uh, let me ask a question. Uh, we don't have a a poll online, but I'm going to ask you just to think about this. What's the product of our factory, the clinical research factory? Is it new therapies, efficacy, safety, data? Just think about that for a second. I can't check your answers, but I know you're thinking something, or maybe you're thinking something else. This may be a trick question, but I think the closest answer here would be data, because going back to my IRB days, when you think about the IRB criteria for approval, it's about the risks to the subject being reasonable in relation to the knowledge, the importance of the knowledge that may result from that study. So I think the product of the factory is knowledge, whether that leads to an approval or a non-approval of something, it's knowledge that we're trying to gain. And, uh, and so how can we best do that given the tools and the experience that we have? So if you go back thousands of years and you, you, you go back to how medicines and, and therapies have been developed, we've gone from an experiential kind of uh, methods of, of gaining uh, information to experimental over the, over the centuries, over the millennia. And frankly, on both ends of this are observation, uh, observation of an individual human being and are they sweating or vomiting or you know, whatever is wrong with them to observation on the right side, which is where we can observe thousands or millions of people through data available to us now that was not uh, up until recently. But as you go through time, and this is where that influenza pandemic is in, in the middle of it, uh, there have been a lot of advances in vaccines uh, in the 1800s. And they thought, I believe, uh, that they could find something to treat people during that influenza pan pandemic. But it, 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 frankly, it was overwhelming. As you all know, it, it killed maybe 50 million, 100 million, nobody, they lost count because so many people died. The people counting probably died. 
but they during this time there have been advances all the way through and and I quoted Leonardo Leonardo da Vinci at the bottom uh, who didn't invent the experiment but described it pretty well in the 1500s about what it takes to go from just looking at something and ex and seeing how it works and just observing it to actually doing a, a some sort of controlled experiment to to determine how things work and why they work. So if you go to the 1930s and 40s, you get the concept of cooperative research where you have multiple investigators working on the same study. And then in the 1940s, mid 1940s, the idea of a randomized clinical trial uh, came into being. So that's 75 years ago that we since we started doing RCTs. Uh, one of the best example of you know, mid, mid 20th century is the, the Salk uh, vaccine trials for polio, where there were 20,000 investigators involved and about 1.8 million subjects. That's, that's a big trial. And think about doing that with paper, <laughs> paper and no EDC and, you know, no technology. They did it on paper. That's a major advance in how you're doing research and the number of people you're involving in it. So you fast forward a little bit more and you get to the 1980s. You've got uh, quintiles, PPD, PRA, and, and the, the CROs came into being to make research more efficient. They made those factories that we still work in really hyper efficient and still do. You go a little further in time, you get the tech boom. So you get the connection of first you get desktops uh, on, on people's desks so that they can use computer power and then you connect them together through the internet all the way to today uh, to where you get the internet of medical things and use of real world evidence. But still, I'd argue, we are still focused on the randomized clinical trial, the 75 year old model to do most of our research. And um, it's worked, I think, but has it? So is the randomized clinical trial working? I don't think it is. Um, and, and as I was reading up on this, I, uh, I found a, a quote from a, the CEO of a nonprofit who, um, who said, you know, we have, um, we have 2,000 oncology immunotherapy trials ongoing. This is from 2017. 2,000 trials ongoing, and we need 500,000 uh, study participants in those trials. However, there are only 50,000 uh, participants in all oncology trials worldwide. Now, that's a problem. That's an existential threat to me. That's an existential threat to advancing new therapies, advancing new drugs. If you can't get the patients to participate, uh, it's not going to work. And we all know uh, that, that uh, studies don't recruit to, to their expectations. Most of them don't. That's an old, old saying that, and well known in the industry. We know that investigators uh, are reluctant to be uh, uh, excuse me, doctors are reluctant to be investigators in trials. We know that patients are reluctant to participate in trials. You know, my, my wife and I have a joke every time we watch a movie that uh, I say, you know, wait for it, wait for it, because sooner or later the villain appears, and the villain recently is always a bad drug company. It's bad pharma. It's the constant gardener. It's Spider-Man. It's Mission Impossible. It's always a bad drug company. Yet, if you think about the people you know, you look at yourself, but look at the people you know. How many people working in oncology are evil villains? I, I don't know of anybody working on oncology that isn't passionate about bringing treatments to cure cancer. Yet, there's, there's this difference in perception, in, at least in America, uh, between how we see ourselves and how the public sees us. And if we, the public doesn't see us as uh, as re re really interested in their long-term health and well-being, they aren't going to participate. So how are we going to fix that? I mean, how, how th this clinical research factory is not producing what we want it to. We made it really efficient, but it doesn't matter if it's efficient if it's not producing the results, if it's not producing the knowledge and the data that we need. So that leads me to a different kind of factory. Uh, decentralized and hybrid trial. So some of you may already know this. Some of you may be smarter than me on this, but maybe you don't know this. And when I first started thinking about this, I was going to draw a picture of a decentralized trial. And I decided if you draw a picture of a decentralized trial, you've drawn one picture. 
And there are many ways to do this. So you can't draw a single picture to describe this. There are many ways to do it. The key thing is we're taking the study to the participant. We're designing it around the participant. That's where it starts. We're not starting with, I have this drug, I need to get investigators, and I need to recruit people to go to those investigative sites. This is all about the participants or the patients and how to engage them in the study that we need to, uh, to run. This is related to pragmatic trials, which you may or not be fr uh, familiar with. Um, if you think about the, the, the purpose of different trials, uh, efficacy is what we're looking for if we're going to, uh, looking for marketing approval. Uh, you need a well-controlled trial with uh, tight inclusion and, and exclusion criteria. You need to find just the right patient to take out all the noise and focus on the signal so you can find safety and efficacy uh, measures. Pragmatic trial focuses on effectiveness. So you want to find out how something works in a real world setting. And there's, there are el there's an element of uh, this pragmatic trial in decentralized models because you're, you're trying to do something in a, a you, you want to control, but you want to have things done in a setting that's more like what a patient would experience uh, in, in their normal life outside the experiment. Then there's the hybrid. The hybrid is we, when you take a, you can take a traditional randomized control trial and you can incorporate some of these de decentralized methods or pragmatic methods into that trial. So you can have sites and you can have non-sites, if that makes sense. So those are the kind of the three kind of ways to describe trials. And, and if you think about uh, what Dr. Scott Gottlieb talked about a year ago, before, while he was still the FDA commissioner, he talked about this, and he talked about the fact that you needed these trials to be done at the point of care. You need a doctor involved. Um, and that you wanted to make sure that you had treatments from community providers. This is the, what I'm talking about with getting away from the idea of bad pharma, where you're, you're having patients and doctors together, the dyad. There is no such thing as a patient without a doctor. It, a patient is a human being, but you have to have a doctor to be, have that patient relationship. So the key, I think, to getting back to uh, enabling more people to participate in research is getting it back to the doctors who treat them. So here are the benefits. Uh, and I didn't invent these. And most of the things I'm talking about here, I didn't invent. I didn't think up myself. But I read a lot, and there are a lot of there's a great deal of literature out there that I'd encourage you to read uh, if you want to know more about this. Uh, this came from CTTI, the Clinical Transformation Trials Initiative, um, which does great work in in describing and, and coming up with industry level kind of thoughts about things. And so most of these are there. And how can you argue with improved retention and shortened timelines? Uh, and, and those things. This is motherhood and apple pie. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to highlight on this, though, and one of the things that the CTTI recommendations did not have is, is talking about adequate and well control. That's what the FDA requires for approval, that, that it be the, for approval of a drug. It has to be come from an adequate and well controlled trial process. So I think sometimes I've, I've heard that a concern about a decentralized trial is that you're compromising on quality of the study or data integrity. And that is simply not true, not if it's designed appropriately and executed appropriately. So you can have adequate and well-controlled in decentralized, and you can do it faster and better and all these other things. Another point on this I wanna highlight is diversity. We, uh, we worry a lot about diversity, but I, I think as an industry, we're maybe we're not doing much about it. Uh, as much as we should. If you have a centralization of research sites in major metropolitan areas, uh, there's some great academic medical centers, great universities doing research. But if it's a fact, and again, there's, there are surveys that indicate this, if it's a fact that uh, someone going more than a half an hour from their home to research is about the extent that they're willing to go. And if they're more than a half an hour away, they're not gonna travel that far, they will not participate. So if you've got a great university like Washington University in St. Louis, how, how um, 
can you expect somebody from Columbia, Missouri to go 100 miles to Washington University to participate in one of their great oncology studies? The likelihood is, is minimal unless that patient has no other choice. Not to mention, you have things like uh, the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. I'm, I'm, I live in Texas. And in the Rio Grande Valley on the south side of the state, there are a million people, a million people who really don't have access to clinical trials. So what does that say about the opportunity for diversity in trials? We need to be able to expand out. And the way to expand is to, is to focus on the patient and where they are, not on where our sites are. It's, it's an entire mindset change that we have to go through. So let me do another poll. Again, you get to just think of your own answers. You don't have to write it down. I, I will not check your score, but uh, just think about this. What's the least likely thing to be conducted remotely? Uh, a dose escalation study, sleep study, ultrasound, home immunotherapy, or, or none of these? Are they all possible? Well, I would say that Home dose escalation is probably the least likely thing. If you've got a safety study, you're not going to do this in a decentralized fashion. You need tight controls. You need somebody who's monitoring that person minute to minute uh, to make sure that they're not having some sort of reaction and they need to be pulled off the drug. So I, I think that's probably the least likely. But some of these others actually are possible. And again, you may already know this, but I didn't. I learned a lot in, in prepping for this. There are ultrasound devices portable that you can use at home, uh, approved by the FDA, like this one on the, on the right, excuse me, on the left. Um, and I have a friend who, uh, who works at a CRO who says they've used this in studies. So you can use an approved ultrasound device uh, in a study uh, because, well, why not? So you don't have to drag people into the office to do this. You can send it to them and have them do, that at, do them at home with proper coaching and, and oversight. Uh, on the right-hand side is a monitor for, uh, for polysomnography, a sleep study. I did a sleep study 10 years ago, and I went into a room, and they hooked me up with a bunch of wires, and I had to stay there overnight. This is portable, so they can send it to you at home, give you instructions on how to hook it up to yourself, and you can sleep with it, and you can get that data sent remotely. You don't have to go to a site. Now, these may you may already know about these. I'll bet that there are things out there that have been approved recently that you don't know about that could be incorporated into clinical trials or some trial you're working on. Uh, if you knew about it and if you, if you or we could think about how we could apply these technologies in a controlled manner uh, in, a, in a study design. Eligo has a, uh, a system we call SOAR, uh, System of Accelerator Research. Great, great sound, right? Soaring above the crowd. Um, and, and this is a GCP compliant, so high quality data, decentralized sightless clinical trial with a single PI. It has these attributes, these five attributes. Remember I talked about the patient and the physician uh, as a dyad. The, the, th these two things have to come together. Uh, the quality in, of the data has to be uh, integrated from the start, and that means down at the bottom using CDISC standards, which can flow straight through from the collection, the point of collection, to the submission to the FDA. No translation, just flow it straight through. The middle point is the main point, that the workflow itself is centered on the patient. So if you're thinking about designing a study, you start, you have to flip the script. You have to turn it upside down and figure out what, am, what is the knowledge I'm trying to gain? Who are the patients that I want to participate? And how do I get to them? What's the best way to get to them? It's not, I have a study, I want to gain knowledge, how do I find investigators who know about this and can, uh, and, and can do the trial at their site? It, it flips the script entirely upside down. Uh, then you see the thing about informed consent. There, there are great uh, e-consent uh, e companies out there, uh, but informed consent does not have to go through an e-consent platform. Uh, there, there are ways to do it through SOP and through technology that enables you to use a paper consent if you need to. But you just need to s simplify the process and use the flexibility that the regulations now have since 2016 and the uh, uh, 21st Century Cures Act that 
that enables uh, alteration or waiver of informed consent in FDA trials that was not available before. So there are ways to simplify how we do informed consent. And then the learning cycles. It should not take 17 years to get a drug to market. Now you might think, well, th these five things are, uh, are elego marketing gimmicks. They're not. They're from Janet Woodcock. Dr. Woodcock, uh, who's been at the FDA since, I think, 1994, these came from a, a keynote address she gave at a conference two years ago. So we didn't invent this. And, and if you think that the regulators and the FDA and other agencies aren't interested in this, they are. You, I, I showed you the quote from, uh, from Dr. Gottlieb, this from Dr. Woodcock. I think there is plenty of support from regulatory agencies to do more of these. If we would be, as an industry, would be willing to think differently and, and work differently. It can be done, and I'll tell you why, in this case study. We did a, a, a decentralized trial using the SOAR model uh, in 2019, and the, the, here was the problem. We had a diagnostic company uh, that wanted to do a, uh, a, a, an alternative to colonoscopy, so check for colorectal cancer without doing a colonoscopy. And you have to have a diverse patient set for this kind of trial. And if you did it, you could do it with 100 different sites or 200 different sites. But the doctors who do this, the gastroenterologists, were a little bit disincentivized to do this because they, in, in short, get paid for doing screening colonoscopy. So why would they want to do um, a, a, a trial, support a trial that, that, that threatens their future? The best bid the uh, sponsor got was 13 million, three years from a CRO, which is, that sounded about right from, from a, a normal uh, randomized control trial design. So what we did, Eligo did, was partner with 83Bar, which is a patient activation company. And we and they uh, identified a process focused on the patient. Remember, this is all patient focused to enroll, identify and enroll patients to, to do this screening procedure through social media. So it was, a, it was, it was through face, a Facebook campaign all across the nation. So if you think about Columbia, Missouri and St. Louis that I mentioned for Washington University, you can get Columbia, Missouri, you can get Bozeman, Montana, you can get the Rio Grande Valley of, uh, of Texas, you can get patients from all over the country. That creates diversity in age and socioeconomic background, that gets you diversity uh, and location. So in doing this, once we identified them, uh, they consented to, to, to participate. Uh, we sent them a lab kit, they collected their sample and sent it to the lab, and then they scheduled a colonoscopy. When that colonoscopy was completed, uh, we, uh, we got the results of it uh, with a medical release form and then uh, we, we gathered all this data in Intelligo, which is Eligo's uh, e-consent, excuse me, e-source system uh, and, and clinical trial management system. So we integrated with 83Bar and collected the data. And all this was coordinated by a central PI with uh, a pathologist to actually look at the, res at the results. And we had a, a full QC process behind that. So here's the results. It, the, the, the story doesn't matter until the very end, the punchline. We did it in six months. It cost $3 million. There was no CRR involved. We got 1,000 patients, and we got a data set because we were gathering data in, a, in a, a usable form immediately with no transcription to an EDC. It was straight through. We did it. It can be done. And here's the timeline we used. Uh, I arrived on the 26th of August, 2019, right in the middle of this. And I was not familiar. I, I think I was wondering, what is this? Uh, and then I watched it evolve and I said, oh my gosh, I, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing because I, my experience was in a randomized control, uh, controlled trial world. I, my experience is with uh, Shulman IRB and with INC research before that. This was not in my head that this could be done. And then I saw it happening and I saw November kickoff and this thing, as one of our consultants says, is a controlled explosion. It's not a train going down a tr slow train going down a track like most clinical trials. It's an explosion. 
enrollment came fast and furious. The, the data we gathered came quickly. The sponsor could see directly, day to day, the, the data as it was gathering, as it was being gathered. It was an, an amazing. I, I simply couldn't believe it. And now I'm part of it, and I'm very proud of it, uh, of, of what our team did, obviously. But, but this is possible, and this is just one example of what can be done with decentralized studies. Remember, one decentralized study is one study. There are many ways to do this. This is one. So let me bring it back to, to, to COVID, to, to a pandemic. What, what we need to do, we have this opportunity uh, ahead of us. We, we are so constrained by uh, the inability to get to sites, for example. Uh, I saw a, a, a note from uh, Western Copernicus Group and from IQVIA that said uh, about a month ago that there were 80, 70 to 80 percent of sites were not accessible. 80 percent of sites not accessible. Now, what does that mean, really? What it might mean, because that wasn't clear, what it might mean is that the CRAs could not physically get to the site to do their monitoring. Well, if you have an e-source platform, if you have technology, you should be able to do uh, uh, source data verification entirely remotely. And if you're using a risk-based quality management system, you should be able to go see the sites physically that you really need to see because you're concerned about something happening there. But if it's routine, you should be able to do everything remotely. Well, why not? The only barrier is that many sites are still using paper, uh, source data binders, paper binders. We use technology. We use an e-source system and an uh, e-investigator uh, site file. So it's all electronic. And if you're a CRA, you can come to a uh, Elego site remotely and you can do what you need to do without leaving your desk at home. We also need to embrace, truly embrace, uh, using fewer patients, uh, and in a more decentralized way. I, I think I, I, I've read so much in the last month about this topic, and I think there, there are plenty of opportunities that we, we can use to advance decentralized methods, maybe not everything, but some things, so that we can get more patients into trials, that we can gather more knowledge easier, faster, more efficiently, cheaper. And, and I, I, I may sound like I'm pandering here, but this was like an aha moment for me. The light turned on. Uh, I, I've been in clinical trials now for a while now, and frankly, it, it gets discouraging because it's so hard to get someone to convince someone to come into a site. It doesn't have to be that hard. We can do it a different way for many types of trials, not all trials, many types. And we need to share this across sites. That's what COVID is as a catalyst for change for us. So I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, this has not been intended to be all about Elego, but I do need to tell you about Elego because this is what we're built to do. Uh, this is our purpose. This is our mission. And it's built on, on, on making doctors and patients able to work together in clinical trials because clinical trial is a care option at each site that we work with. Key point, we want to maintain that trusted patient-physician relationship. We think that's critical. I personally think that's the key to making the, the perspective of bad pharma company something that, that we, that's, that's history. It can change. And last, we want to make sure that patients have convenient access to research. And frankly, decentralized trials are probably the best way to do that. So I'm going to wrap it up now. It's only a uh, half an hour. I know I've been talking a lot. I hope there's some questions. And if there are, I'm going to entertain them now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Eli, for that very insightful presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Now I would like to invite our audience to continue sending in their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. I've already received some questions, so I will start with those. So Eli, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, I'm just going to take back control first, and then I will start with the questions. Okay, so you should see my screen there. There it is. Okay, so here's our first question that I've got lined up here from our audience member. And the question is, not sure I understand pragmatic trials. Can you give us an example? Yeah, thank you. I'll try not to, uh, to look up Dr. Google for every one of these questions. I'll try to do it off the top of my head. 
And if I can, I'm happy to follow up with you later on this and give you a better answer. But I'll give you a short example of this one. Uh, one, of the, one of the trials I've read about uh, is, uh, it was an oncology trial. Uh, so the, the standard of care is something like uh, three weeks on and one week off, uh, you know, a week to week kind of uh, infusion or, or some sort of um, uh, delivery of, of this drug to the patient. And so the experiment was, can we take um, that same medicine and use lower doses uh, and do it on a, like, almost like microdosing, so on a daily basis and still get the same result? So th this is using the same compound, the same drug in a different manner and using it in a real world setting. So this is using uh, the, 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 the doctor's patient relationship and uh, shipping the drug to the home. So, it, uh, and, and using EHR data and all the kind of things I'm talking about with these decentralized methods uh, to do this uh, real world evidence trial. Not, not looking at observational evidence or evidence gathered after the fact to look at it, as sometimes we think of real world evidence, but in, an, in a post-marketing situation, a post-marketing trial, uh, using a real world situation uh, to, to experiment with different dosing levels. Hope that answers it. Okay, thank you very oh. much for that. Uh, here's our next question now. Uh, the question is, Aren't we already using a lot of the technologies and techniques you mentioned, like eCOA, remote monitoring, and e-consent? What's different? Um, another great question. Um, I would say that, yes, we are. It, we clearly are. And I gave you some examples of, of some of these methods that are being put into place right now. I, however, I would argue the way that we're using them. We are still using them and hooking them up to our standard randomized uh, controlled trial. We're, we're not taking advantage of new methods uh, and new thinking and new processes to do these things, but they're there for, our, for the taking if we would just think differently about the design of the trials itself. So it's not about the technology, it's using whatever the technology is available and, and focusing first on the patient and how to get the knowledge that you need that only a patient can, can give you uh, and using all those tools and technologies in a different way, to put it together in a different way. That's what I was trying to get at. Okay, perfect, thank you. Here's our next question. How does regulatory bodies, FDA, view these decentralized trials? Well, actually, uh, you could read all about it. I, I hate to quote, um, you know, I, I quote chapter and verse on that, but there is there is uh, FDA guidance on on decentralized trials, and I quoted to you, to FDA leaders on this. I think what the FDA's interest is, and if, if I, I hope they're, I don't know if they're FDA people on this call, <laughs> but I would, I would say <laughs> if, if I was at the FDA, uh, I would be interested to make sure that whatever we're, we're bringing forward for approval has been, has evidence of efficacy and safety. I mean, isn't that the, the most important thing? So how you get to that, uh, there, there are many paths to get to that. And if you can use a simpler path, because their, their interest is also in bringing forth, uh, is, is, is a healthy, healthy nation and bringing, uh, bringing into a, a approval uh, new medications, new devices that actually improve the health of the nation. I think that's also the FDA's interest. So I, I would offer, read the guidance that they've already written uh, uh, about decentralized trials and I think the, basically, I think the support is there. If we would get our own, our own head and think about designing trials differently, I think that's the key. What's next? Okay, what's next? Here we go. Uh, the next question I have up for you is, is what you've talked about the same as virtual trials? Um, I actually avoided intentionally using the term virtual trials uh, in this presentation, that t term is a uh, is a term in vogue uh, because everything we want everything to be virtual. And there are companies that are that are named after the idea of virtual. Uh, when I think of virtual, I think of virtual reality, and I think of the other aspect of um, of virtual trials, which is you could do computer simulations. I, I think our industry 
does less actual simulation of uh, human biology uh, and, and other aspects bef before we actually uh, take a chance on a human being. If you're, if you're at NASA, you do not put a, an astronaut in space before you simulate for years uh, how, that, how that space travel will go. Yet, the first thing we do after we do uh, animal trials is to put it in a human being in, a, uh, in some sort of phase one study. I think other industries are actually ahead of us in uh, using uh, computer simulations. Uh, and so that's why, I, that's what I think virtual means. And I, I've read papers, FDA papers uh, from their, uh, from one of their um, directorates uh, that use that term. However, what the, the term in vogue in our industry appears to be virtual. Uh, I, just, I just don't see it like that. I think we need to get our, our, our naming convention straight uh, uh, a little bit better than that. My personal view. Okay, thank you very much for that one there. Uh, the next question I have for you is, how much of a challenge is it to engage the non-research experience treating physician to support the study? Uh, another great question. Um, in some ways, I think it's very easy because you're asking them to do, you're asking the doctor to to practice medicine, and so you want them, uh, you you want them treating the patient the way they normally would. There, if there is an experimental procedure, can you do that in some other way, where the actual principal investigator, with the responsibilities of the of the PI as described in ICHGCP and FDA regulations, where the the actual experimental piece of it is separate from the standard of care. You want doctors to be doctors. And I'll tell you just one aspect of Elego is we engage doctors uh, who, who practice medicine but don't do research. There's so many of them that don't. Uh, we enable them to do research by taking the hassle out of doing research. We try to do the regulatory, the contracts, the finance. The, we provide study managers. We provide them the, the wherewithal, the, the, the functionality, the, the structure to do research. And uh, if, if you can take the, that regulatory burden that we saddle our doctors with to do research, uh, I think there's plenty of interest <laughs> uh, from doctors uh, to, to engage in research if, uh, if we provide them an opportunity. Thank you very much for that question. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next one. Uh, the next question I have for you is, most sites do not have technology to be remotely monitored without the burden of scanning source documents, et cetera. Remote seems to be more work for sites. And he has a question, no? Can you say that one again? Yeah, uh, most sites do not have technology to do remotely, to be remotely monitored without the burden of scanning source documents, et cetera. Remote seems to be more work for sites. Oh, I understand. Uh, yes, uh, it can be if you are still using paper source documents. It absolutely will be. I've heard horror stories from sites who have to scan in documents and PDF them and go through hoops in the last couple of months to be able to give visibility to CROs and sponsors. It absolutely is an impediment, which is why we should start using electronic source documents. Uh, there are major institutions that can take can afford to take their EHR and configure it uh, and use that as their e-source system. But if you look at a, uh, a community site, they can't afford that. They can't afford, they'll use an EHR, but they can't afford to configure it that way. Uh, but as, t as Elego and others uh, provide e-source technology, the cost of that technology will drop. Uh, just like uh, a few years ago, nobody used uh, ECRFs Everybody was using paper CRFs and nobody used EDC until it became ubiquitous. It became so widespread. And I think that's what will happen with eSource. It may not happen now. Uh, it does with our sites, but it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not completely uh, taken by the entire industry, at least in the United States, but I think it will. And we need to take advantage of it as, it, as, as time goes on. Okay, here's our next question. Can you conduct a study with traditional sites and a decentralized group at the same time, or do they have to be run separately? Uh, to me, the, the answer to that is that is what a hybrid trial is, where you, you can have a group of uh, 
physical sites and match that again the protocol's got to be designed this way and match that and, and match that with a decentralized site a single site if you want to think of it that way uh, a virtual site if, if i can use that word that way uh, you can you can combine them but you have to design it in up front it's not something you can you can build in on the end you have to design it that way from the beginning but yes it can be done Okay, all right, well, here's our next question. What is the quality of the data that comes from a decentralized trial? If you aren't collecting it in person, do you really know who is providing the data? That is a challenge, and uh, but it's not an insurmountable challenge. There are biometrics and other ways. Think about this, if, if I have an ePro device, how do I know the three-year-old doesn't pick it up and start playing with it and entering data for me? Uh, because that three-year-old can probably use that system just as well as anyone. So there has to be protections, uh, and uh, and this has again has to be built in uh, to consider uh, making sure that uh, whoever is providing those data really is that person, uh, either through biometrics or some sort of check afterwards. Um, uh, you know, to, you, 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 there will always be. To me, this is risk-based quality management. You always have to be worrying if even in a face-to-face uh, -face kind of thing. Is somebody making up the data? That, that, that's, a con that's a concern that the sponsor has to have. Uh, you wanna make sure that the data is real and it came from a real person uh, and, it, and that it's valid. Uh, so I think that's a problem in both uh, traditional trials and decentralized trials, but it is solvable. Um, I, but I completely agree, it is a, um, it's something that has to be addressed and uh, and, and ensured that it's that it's valid. Okay, thank you, Eli, for that. Here's our next question for you. Uh, this one's a bit long. The example you presented today estimated to be three million. For small companies, this is a significant cost that the company may not afford. What is the cost effectiveness on decentralized trials? What type of studies are decentralized studies most appropriate for? Wow, that is a big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let me let me see if I can pull that apart a little bit. Okay. First off, uh, comparing it, three million dollars is a lot of money. I do not have three million dollars. I cannot lend it to you. But neither do I have thirteen million dollars, which is the alternative to that. In in the case study that I gave you, so it's cost is relative, uh, and and you you it does cost money to do a decentralized. It costs money to do any clinical trial, but think about the cost. Say it's an alternative of with doing this decentralized or 100 sites. How much does it cost to have a patient grant for 100 investigators? How much does it cost for an IRB submission for 100 sites? How much does it cost for the travel of a CRA uh, or uh, you know to go do on-site monitoring? When you add up the true costs, the total costs of a randomized clinical trial in the traditional model, it, it a decentralized trial uh, is is microscopic. Maybe that's a hyperbole. A decentralized trial is much smaller uh, because you've got the efficiency of having a single PI. Again, this is the model I gave you: a single PI uh, and in gathering data in, in a in a different way. So I agree, three million dollars is is a lot less. And if you don't have the money, you can't you certainly can't run any kind of trial uh, at if you're looking to get any scale of patients and doctors involved, you can't run any trial unless you have some. Can you repeat the second part of that question? Because I've lost the bubble now. On <laughs> no problem, no problem. Uh, let me just find it here again. Okay, so okay, so the example presented today estimates to be three million for small companies. Is a significant cost that w could the company may not afford. What is the cost effectiveness on decentralized trials? And the other part was what type of studies are decentralized studies most appropriate for? Um, the second, I'll, I think I answered the first part. At least yeah. I attempted to. Um, the second part, uh, the example I gave you was on a, a device study. Um, I think it can be modified, it's, it's really the amount of the uh, uh, imagination you can put on it. Uh, I don't think you can do it for, as I mentioned, like a phase one study where it's a, a safety study. I don't think that's appropriate. I think uh, maybe maybe not phase two studies. I don't, again, I'm thinking drugs, but I, I can think of most phase three studies that you could design the study if you thought about it hard enough. If you turned 
the way you th you're thinking about it upside down, that there are decentralized methods that you can employ. So that the methods are more, are, are, are more important than the technology. Uh, the, the methods of, are, are you can, can you send out somebody to do a home visit? That's part of decentralized. Uh, can you uh, ship the drug to the patient instead of making them come to the site to get it? So there are many aspects of decentralized, which is why I didn't want to draw a picture of it, because there are, there are so many ways to look at this. There's so many aspects to it. Um, I hope that answers. Okay, thank you very By much. By the way, I, it's, it's afternoon. I, we have about nine minutes left. I wish I had a beer and I could drink a beer with <laughs> all of you and talk about this because this is, to me, this is the most fascinating thing going on in clinical research night. Yeah, it is. It is a hot topic for sure. Uh, Eli, you know, we have one more question left. Uh, we're going to try to squeeze that in. I think we can. Uh, as you said, that we do have a few minutes left. So here is the last question for you. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Are you saying that CROs are doomed? Is that business model going away? <laughs> I hope I didn't say that. I, I did not, if I, if I implied that, uh, I, having worked at a CRO, uh, having dear friends that work at CROs, uh, I, no, CROs are not going away. There will always be room for doing a standard randomized clinical trial, number one. Number two, I think you're seeing CROs move into this space more aggressively. Um, uh, in, in, for example, in uh, late 2019, Janssen and PRA, the CRO, uh, announced that they were doing the first pivotal decentralized trial, uh, that they were taking the FDA, they were going to start it and take the results to the FDA for approval. So they were doing it in heart failure, entirely decentralized pivotal trial. So, no, I think the CROs have a, a big role to play in here, and I think they're moving, IQVIA, they're, they're all moving into this area. Um, I, I think the problem will be if CROs do not move into this area. If they stick to the old, old ways of doing things, eventually the economics will, will catch up to them. Um, so, no, I, I, I do not think the CRO industry is doomed, uh, not, not at all, but I think it has to change. That's the key, is changing the factory. Uh, so if that's the last question, we have a couple minutes left, so I'll give you your time back. Uh, if you're still <laughs> listening, obviously I cannot see any of your facial reactions. You may be multitasking. You may be asleep. Maybe I just told you a bedtime <laughs> story and you're taking an afternoon nap. I hope not because this topic, as I said, really interests me. I'm going to be on a chat here afterwards. If you'd like to talk some more, uh, either during this chat or later, I am happy to talk to you about decentralized trials, and I'm happy to talk about Eligo uh, and our way of doing business. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for those questions. We have reached the end of the question and answer portion of the webinar. If we couldn't attend to your questions, the team at Eligo Health Research may follow up with you after this presentation. If you have any further questions, please direct them to the email address that's on your screen. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email with, from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, I'm about to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event at that link and also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join us in thanking our speaker, Eli Alford, Chief Operating Officer with Elego Health Research, for that very insightful presentation. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at X Talks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, take care and bye for now.